I am very, very excited to introduce this uh, panel, particularly because my alma maters are represented on this panel with Oberlin and Yale and Chicago in two out of the three. But I fir first will introduce uh, David Ford. He is, em and I'm sorry, I just lost my technology. David Ford is Emerit Emerit em Emeritus Regis Professor of Divinity at the University of Cambridge. His research interests include ecumenical theology, theology and poetry, the shaping of universities and the fields of theology and religious studies, and interfaith theology and relations. He is the founding director of the Cambridge Interfaith Program and a co-founder of the Society for Scriptural Reasoning. He is most recently the author of the commentary, The Gospel of John. David Kamitska is Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Oberlin College and Conservatory. Yay! <laughs> Another Obi in the house. <laughs> a scholar of religious studies. <laughs> he has served as chair of the Jewish Studies Program and the Middle East North African Studies Program and the Department of Religion. He's author of Theology and Contemporary Culture. Catherine Tanner is the Frederick Marquand uh, Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale University. Her research relates the history of Christian thought to contemporary issues of theological concern using social, cultural, and feminist theory, most recently having to do with modern financial markets. She is most recently the author of Christianity and the New Spirit of Capitalism, based in part on her 2015 and 16 Gifford Lectures of the same title. Thank you all for being here, and we will start with David Ford. We'll have about 15 minutes each. Well, I'm sorry it's me again, but, <laughs> but, but I'm filling in this time for, uh, for Mike Higton, uh, who, and I, I think it was thought good to have somebody from the other side of the Atlantic, so uh, <coughs> this, this is me. Um, and um, the, the, the basic question I want to approach this through, there's so many angles one can go through and there's lovely things to come uh, from the people who were really meant to be here, um, but the, uh, the, the, the question I want to ask is that in societies like ours, now what I mean by that is in a very general sense is societies that are not really religious societies, not really secular societies in my reading of it, uh, but complexly multi-religious and multi-secular societies. You know, in other words, there's all these sort of strands and it's very, very hard to generalize uh, about them in that. But, but in the, these sorts of societies, one of the things that we really need is to learn how to be healthily plural. We're plural whether we like it or not in all sorts of ways. But, but how can we learn to be healthily plural? And the question I'm asking is, what's the contribution of universities to being healthily plural, ideally? You know, and <coughs> I, I, but, but I'm trying to draw on my experience uh, in various places. And it's, it's worth saying that because uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, I came from classics in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, an Irish, so, so completely outside theology, and, uh, <clears throat> and that's been very important, actually, to, to have a, you know, a civilization that's not um, Christian or Jewish or Muslim. <laughs> Two civilizations, actually, Greek and Roman, yet have fed into things, and uh, it, it's always been a, you know, you know, deep, a, a source of deep meaning for me that's yet uh, you know, in, in interesting dialogue with the Jewish Christian and so forth. Um, <clears throat> but, um, but then I, I did theology in Cambridge and then later on taught there, uh, where theology, and I'm going to use the language of theology and religious studies. We all know that it's endlessly complex to, to look at all these categories and so forth, but <coughs> that's what I, I, I use for now for shorthand. Uh, where, where, and in line with a lot of British institutions, the way theology and religious studies are is that it's been a history of largely theology departments opening up towards religious studies and trying to integrate them and trying therefore to have a, a, um, you know, a, a, a marriage of theology and religious studies in, in, in there. And then I came to Yale uh, where I saw there was quite a division between 
theology and religious studies. There wasn't, it, it wasn't one institution, so to speak, governance-wise and that. And, uh, well, you, you all know the, the situation here. I don't have to explain that to you. Um, but I, then I also studied in Tübingen. And, uh, and there, state-funded theology was the dominant thing when I was there. I know they've opened up to more things in the, their versions of religious studies since then. But, but, but the... Um, uh, and um, that, was, that was just very, you know, the big division was between Catholic and Evangelisch, you know, in, in, in Tübingen. <laughs> and uh, so, um, <clears throat> having been through all those, then I got my first job in the University of Birmingham, where I was for 15 years, and then went, I've only had two jobs in my life, I, and then I went to uh, Cambridge for 24 years. And... In both of those, one was in a, I mean, Birmingham was a very secular university where one was continually negotiating the, 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 the field in complex ways. Um, Cambridge was a bit more, uh, you know, the, the, was more theology friendly in a way, um, but, but Cambridge was trying to open up towards uh, doing more religious studies, you know, ha having more religious studies involved. And so that was also a, a very in instructive 24 years. Um, now, the, um, my, my basic thought is that society needs, our sorts of societies need places where the religions can be dealt with through a range of disciplines. Um, and where people in all sorts of relationships to faith traditions, religious traditions, whatever one calls them, can engage with each other. That's, that's the ideal sort of, sort of thing that you have. You have places where, where, where that can happen. Um, and I, I love the, what, what, what Cathy Tanner is going to say a bit later uh, the, the, about the, the way in which culture relates to theology and relates to the academy. And I won't even try to, to go into, into that, 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 that side of things, but it's, it's very interesting. I was also deeply interested in the motivations of students that I found over the years in, in Cambridge. You know, what really brought people to do theology in Cambridge in particular? And my conclusion was that there was personal quest for meaning and uh, you know, making sense of life and vocations and, and so forth, some of which led into vocations in church or other religious traditions, the, the, the sort of official side of other, other, other religious traditions. But, um, but also there was a, a lot of people were just absolutely fascinated by it from various academic si sides of things. You know, you could do it through a wide range of disciplines, everything from literature to psychology to science to uh, languages to history to sociology, you know, and, and so forth. And, and that, that intellectual fascination was also a, a, a motivation factor. Um, and then the increasing number of people who seemed to be drawn to it because they recognized that religion was really important in the real world. You know, that, that it, was, it was an important shaper that, you know, the, the, the way in which universities, I think, have more or less woken up, haven't they, uh, to the fact that over 80% of the world's population are involved in the religions <laughs> and that a decent university needs to take that very seriously if it wants to be in the real world and engage with the real world. Uh, and certainly Cambridge, during my time, made quite a, a voyage, I thought, uh, especially at the higher reaches of the university. It's fun, fun, one's own faculty sort of took a long time to catch up on uh, some of these things, about, about how <coughs> uh, significant, you know, how, how the religions operate in the world and how a, a university needed to actually engage with this extraordinarily diverse and fascinating and important and highly dangerous phenomenon that the religions are in, 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 in our world at the moment. Um, and so, so therefore there were, there were a lot more students. And of course, many students combine, multi, you know, combine more than one of those, uh, th those motivations. Um, and you wanted to have, therefore, and, and of course they came from very different backgrounds, and um, the, the, uh, you, you wanted to have a setting where you could um, meet the needs of all these different students that they, 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 they could all have a, you know, a decent education. But also you wanted to try to set it up 
in such a way that they genuinely engage with each other um, and, uh, and crossed over you know, from, from their, ver their various backgrounds and so forth. So, um, so that, 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 there was that. But, um, and my um, conclusion um, you know, was that, uh, and, and I'm going to qualify this uh, when I come to it, but uh, and I, for the 24 years I was in Cambridge where I did have responsibility for trying to shape things you know, along with others, um, I concluded that the, uh, in a way I would, wouldn't I, uh, you know, that the British model was best, <laughs> that, that I, was, I was in favor of the one that I was actually employed by. Um, but it was also, I, I did really appreciate the, uh, the, the benefits of having theology and religious studies together. And my own philosophy about it, it you know, on the national scene in the UK as, as well, as I saw the ways in which other departments were going, and there, there was, you know, there, there's a, a national uh, body as well, TRS UK. Uh, that, that thinks about these things, and you had to do national benchmarking uh, things for the government and so forth. So you had to think together, negotiate together, and come to some sort of a, a consensus about what sort of a field we were, especially in relation to the, the government's funding and research assessment exercises and so forth. That, but um, but, but I, I think the, the, the overall thrust of uh, of the UK was, um, and I felt it was very healthy, uh, was to try to have the, you know, departments where you had theology and religious studies. Now, of course, there were huge issues of resources and how much you could have of one and what the balance was between one. Different departments do it completely, very, very differently in terms of the, all these negotiated settlements. But it's a very British sort of thing. I'm Irish, so I see this partly from the outside. That, that uh, you know, a sort of British pragmatic endless negotiation of, of, of things, and it's not all set on ideological principles or anything like that, that, uh, you know, the, and, and it's evolved very slowly over the years and indifferently in different places and that, but overall I think the ecosystem is one in which you want to have both theology and religious studies, and, you know, in, in, and you can, of course, describe those in, 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 in different ways. Now, um, so I wrote about the, that and I advocated it in all sorts of settings and uh, tried to uh, d d develop it in, uh, help the development at Cambridge as well. But the, um, and I, I think my basic principle in relation to it was that um, this was a healthy ideal thing, but of course there are all sorts of institutional contingencies that come into play, and I'll be, be mentioning those in a minute in relation to the, the other possibilities that, that I've experienced. That, um, the, but, but that where a department was too uh, heavily theology, especially theology in one tradition, it was healthy to try to pluralize it more in relation to the, uh, in relation to other religions, in relation to a range of other disciplines, where a thing was more heavily religious studies, it was healthy to try to balance it up towards the other side, uh, and that the questions, you know, that what one fundamentally wanted, when putting it in general questions, you know, that one wanted a field where it was possible genuinely to, not just to ask, but also answer the questions of meaning, truth, goodness, beauty, and so forth, uh, in relation to different religious traditions, uh, and to bring those into dialogue with each other, and that there were characteristic weaknesses of different types of mix in this. You know, the, in, in the religious studies side of things, it, you, you can, you, you know, you can raise all sorts of questions, of course, and, and you do, but there are certain sorts of ways of following through to answers that are not very, uh, <laughs> are not very favored <laughs> often in, in that setting. Um, and, uh, and, and likewise, there are, there are types of theological setting where 
there are ranges of, of disciplines and approaches within those disciplines that are not very, not very welcome. Now, how do you set up this complex thing? We, we, all, we all know that, the, that this is an endlessly challenging thing for us to do. So, there, that, that's, that's my, was my conclusion in relation to uh, you know, what my ideal type was, but there is a but here, and it's a but in relation to both the others. I mean, when, when I look back, for example, at Birmingham University, uh, where I was, where, where we tried to have a balance of theology and religious studies, and then looked at what happened over the years down to now, effectively, as, as, as I read it, the, uh, you know, a series of appointments almost wiped out the theology side of it. You know, that in other words, that, that, that the, 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 it, it, they didn't manage to preserve that balance. And we all know in active, my goodness, don't we just, the, the complexity of appointments and the politics of appointments and so forth. And therefore, all it needs is, in a smallish department, all it needs is a few appointments to go a, a different way than, than, than it has been. And, and a whole carefully negotiated balance breaks down. Um, and um, I mean, in Cambridge, it was, it was rather different. And, Two, min two minutes, good, yeah. In Cambridge, it was rather different. But, but, but the other but is just how healthy the other two options seem when you are looking at a balance breaking down in an ideal unity of theology and religious studies. In other words, you look at you, <laughs> and, or I was in candor, uh, you know, the, the, as well, the, that, uh, and, and you see that to have a certain institutional independence of the two, uh, where they, they can actually fight the country, where they are not so vulnerable to the, uh, to, to, to the winds of politics within, within one particular united institution and the way in which the people at the top of that institution go and so forth, uh, can, be, uh, can be very good. And also the German one. Uh, when I went back, this is my last, my last thing. But go, going back to Tübingen a few years ago, I was invited back by Leila Demiri, and Christoph Schwerbel, who sadly died since, um, but to do scriptural reasoning there, the way, the way they had a whole course on scriptural reasoning. And I realized that state-funded theology of the German sort had been able to initiate a whole Germany-wide set of posts in Islamic theology. In other words, that it had been able to do justice to the, the Christian particularity, but also was trying to do justice to the Islamic, the Muslim particularity, by cultivating their theology. In other words, in line with what I think is some of the best traditions of German theology. And they were trying to duplicate. Now, it, 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 it's gone in various ways in, in, in different settings. But, uh, you know, when I look at what's possible to, to happen there, um, I see the, the, pluses of the, the pluses of the German system as well. Um, and there'd be an awful lot more to go on that. I mean, my final word really is that scriptural reasoning, that it's a practice that seems to me at its best, and, you know, I've now done it all over the world, in China and India and so forth, that at its best draws on both theology and religious studies in well. You know, that it enables you to go deeper into one particular tradition through its scriptures, deeper into others through their scriptures, and also it really helps if it's in a situation where there is both theology and religious studies. Well, it's really good to be here, and I want to uh, thank uh, Drew and uh, um, Ben and Greg. Thank you for hosting us here. Um, you know, in my day job, I'm thinking constantly about academic institutions, departments, personnel implications, many of the things that David talked about. But, but for now, I think I'm just going to want to focus in on Hans Frey as a person, and I think this is actually very much connected to to um, uh, the previous panel on uh, uh, theology and uh, politics. So, so I knew uh, Professor Fry from 1984 to 1988. I was his uh, doctoral student here. And uh, we had a, a little uh, vegetable garden in the back of his house. Uh, they, uh, he was an avid fan of the perfect cherry tomato and the like. And while we were out there gardening, uh, we would talk a lot about uh, 
you know, things like our unusual pers uh, personal identities uh, uh, in the Christian Theological Guild of the 1980s, uh, the impact of the Second World War uh, on both of our immigrant families, um, and in general about uh, our family experiences during the war. And uh, his family history indeed shaped his identity and in turn, and this is the, where I want to go, uh, informed the outlook, his outlook on American academic and theological culture. Um, I'd first like to suggest a few loose, uh, but I think significant connections, not causation, uh, between Fry's formative years and his professional outlook and contributions to both church and university. So let me begin with Fry's uh, uh, years in Germany uh, between 1922 and 1938. Uh, honestly, I don't think we spent enough time thinking about it. Um, and uh, I think uh, we should think about it because uh, those years uh, really shaped his distinctive and perspicacious insights on American academic culture and theological practice. So as I mentioned, he was born in uh, 1922 into a Jewish family who nominally converted to Christianity. And uh, they soon moved to Berlin uh, and in my conversations with him, as well as in his extraordinary, uh, and I mean extraordinary, 1980 Yale Fortunoff Holocaust testimony, he indicated that by 1930, he was AJ. Uh, he was an avid reader of the German equivalent to the New York, New York Times, the uh, Vossische Zeitung, uh, Germany's then national uh, newspaper of record. Um, he was clearly precocious at eight, uh, particularly in matters political. And, and that was both a blessing and a curse for, the, for, for a young Jew in Berlin during the uh, 1930s. Uh, young Hans could intellectually comprehend the political dynamics at play in Nazi Germany, but he lacked the emotional maturity uh, to absorb it. Uh, Hans, his siblings and parents uh, very much thought of themselves as indigenous in German culture and utterly patriotic. These are his words. Uh, after all, his father and his uncle fought uh, as good Germans during the First World War. His father was wounded three times. His uncle was killed. And that Fries traced their ancestry back to the first German uh, Jewish officer in the Prussian army who fought against Napoleon in the so-called War of Liberation. Fry describes his family as totally assimilated and, and totally secularized, and yet also, and I quote, proud of the fact that they were Jewish, or that we were Jewish in a curious and undefinable way. He also observes in his testimony, we felt that we were Jewish and that was that. Jews were good people. By age 11, Hans' relative equanimity as a middle-class German of Jewish descent was rattled to the core with the rise of the, to power of Hitler in 1933. During this period, Hans experienced a sharp loss of identity and community. Most painfully, his loss of his sense of himself as German. He and his family were robbed of their national identity, which was, as he describes it, much more of our identity than our Jewish identity. But the impact of anti-Semitism on the young Hans was also profound. Fry once told me that in his youth, he would sometimes struggle with self-loathing from the overwhelming Nazi anti-Semitic propaganda. Fry put it this way in his testimony. It took an awful lot as a Jew to be able to say to yourself, I'm not really what they're making me out to be. There's much more that could and really should uh, be explored about Fry's formative experiences in Nazi Germany. The isolation, the loss of the family's professional standing, and the unrelenting terror, literally the unrelenting terror his family experienced. And also his parents' dismay, as Fry describes it himself about his growing Christian faith. After the war, 
he also experienced the gulf, the pay painful lack of candor among Germans during his years as a Fulbright, his year as a Fulbright scholar in Germany in, in 1959. So if you want to understand Fry the person, I would encourage you to carefully read and really even better view the Fortunoff testimony. It's online. Let me observe three points about how Frey understood the significance of his formative years in Nazi Germany before suggesting the impact it had on him as a thinker. First, Frey regarded it as imperative to stand on the side of those being victimized. In the 1930s, his father reclaimed his Judaism, not as a believer, but as a secular political act of resistance. His father's act impacted Fry, who said that if the United States, and I quote, were to go officially anti-Semitic, I would clearly identify myself with the Jewish community because one should always identify oneself with those who are persecuted. Second, Fry intentionally and consistently drew parallels between his personal experience in Nazi Germany and the experiences of systematic terror experienced by others. The experience of legally sanctioned and enforced racism among blacks in South Africa and African Americans in the United States, the genocides of Cambodians and Armenians, the reactionary mob anger against Iranian Americans during and after the Iranian hostage crisis in 1979, and even the, in his words, contempt for Eastern Jews by German Jews, which he described as almost like a form of Jewish anti-Semitism. Thirdly, Fry's formative experience left him with what he describes as a minimal identity and very much an outsider, except to immediate family and to some extent, the church. Let me block quote from Fry's testimony. I will have to confess that even in the church, I find, cer uh, I find certain elements of remoteness. I find myself really one of those curious group of refugees who has been unable to establish any strong communal ties and ra rather mistrust them, one and all. That may be the social or political wound that I carry, inability really to attach myself strongly emotionally to any community. I really find myself much, pretty much an outsider to virtually every group that you could mention. And even as Fry grew, grew through the ranks, from refugee to, to eminent professor of Christian theology, he understood himself at most as an insider-outsider. Let me make one observation about Fry's sense of minimal identity and one about his perspicuous and creative perspective as an insider-outsider. First, I don't think Fry dwelled, dwelled overly much on his sense of minimal identity. This may reflect the phenomenon one finds in many a refugee who is just trying to survive, even well after outwardly becoming settled and secure. But I also think Fry's human acceptance of his minimal identity is deeply rooted in his religious and theological formation. As articulated in the identity of Jesus Christ and in many other writings, for Fry, Jesus' identity and story provides meaning to all stories, to all identities. So religiously and theologically for Fry, there was a Christologically based freedom from self a freedom from having to secure for himself more than a minimal personal identity. Second, Fry as insider-outsider afforded him a vantage point for an underlying skepticism, that's his word, of all group identity and groupthink. Even as a young academic, he was neither unduly cowed by nor unduly wedded to trends in academia. And positively, this vantage point as an insider-outsider 
generated productive tensions that were intellectually creative and generative. So let me just offer two examples of this perspective at work at the bookends of Fry's career as a professor, where he negotiates and enlightens communities from his insider-outsider perspective. The first example comes from 1953, when Fry was just in his third year as assistant professor of religion at Wabash College. The academic dean asked Fry to explain to, uh, to a committee of faculty and trustees the relevance of Wabash's religion courses in his own teaching of theology in the modern college. <laughs> High stakes for a third year assistant professor. The matter being debated was whether courses in theology should be eliminated. Fry's critics wondered whether Wabash needed special courses in religious studies at all, since the examination of religious phenomena could be covered as well, if not better, the critics thought, in sociology, history, or literature, and especially in some comparative perspective. Fry understood the dean's request as amounting to a request for a professional apologia uh, pro vita sua, a defense of his academic life in the academy, and young Professor Fry took this opportunity to articulate a position on his teaching in the academy that he maintained throughout his career. Fry begins his response by addressing his secular critics underlying groupthink, namely their desire to expunge the curricular exploration of religious practice, faith, religious values, and existential commitment, anything particular. In the interest of, and I quote, and he does not hold back in his language, a slavish craving after the mediocre goal of intellectual respectability. As an insider outsider at Wabash, Fry warned his critics that without explicit and richly textured study of God, there would for, they would forgo an essential frame of reference, an interlocutor, by which to evaluate the implicit pantheon of idols, his phrase, the despisers of religion, and I use that term uh, uh, intentionally, the despisers of religion of the 1950s, tended to worship. For example, the idols of, sec of scientific method, secular Western civilization, or the American way of life. Furthermore, his critics also asked, risked the elision of the foundational aim of, the liberal arts, of a liberal arts education, namely the search for the integration and unity of all dimensions of being human. Fry appreciated that the study of theology within the secular academy is not without its tensions, but he argued that it was an important and productive tension. Now the exact variables generating intellectually productive tension for Fry the insider outsider evolved as he pursued the relationship between theology and various modes of thought. But, cre but creatively navigating that, this productive tension remained a hallmark of the next 35 years of his career. So let me fast forward three and a half decades and from Wabash to Yale. I see the insider outsider at work in his teaching and reflections on theological method and the paradigm of the so-called Yale School of Theology of the 1980s, for which Fry himself, as we uh, all have heard, is so rightly associated. But Fry was too much the insider outsider to be a parochial true believer, even with regard to the Yale School. And he didn't want his students to be true believers either. I don't want to exaggerate my point here. As an insider, Fry was, of course, deeply committed to many of the now classic elements associated with the Yale School of the 1980s, diagnosing and co uh, correcting the modern trajectory of the eclipse of biblical narrative, intertextual interpretation, and the primacy of the communal plain sense, which I believe Kathy was the one who really coined that, that phrase, and, and I know Fry uh, was very uh, delighted with that. 
forging a theological method hospitable to the unsubstitutable identity of Jesus Christ, as uh, David Kelsey articulated yesterday. And last but not least, the basic framework of type four, the fourth type Fry associates with Karl Barth in his posthumously published, but far from complete, types of Christ, uh, Christian theology. But as an outsider, Fry was also skeptical about any exuberance by post-liberals regarding their polemic against the liberal tradition. He was particularly concerned about how this exuberance might be shaping the intellectual outlook of his students. Fry did not want to lose the overarching intellectual project of the liberal theological tradition situated in both church and the university, even as he was also one of liberalism's most trenchant critics, both theologically and philosophically. Two years after the publication of George Limbeck's The Nature of Doctrine in 1984, Fry presented his essay, Schleiermacher, Bart and Schleiermacher, Divergence and Convergence. It was an essay meant to mark the centenary of Karl Barth's birth, as we are doing now for Professor Fry. I'd like to end with a brief comment on what I think was his, he was reminding us about through this essay, especially the section entitled Convergence. Fry wrote that this section of his essay might well be titled Journey to Dolesville. For anyone who knew Fry, that signals you should pay attention. The topic of this section is the character of theology and its relation to other disciplines, particularly philosophy broadly understood. Fry had what he describes as his hypothetical Bart and hypothetical Schleiermacher pose questions to each other about the risks of the other's approach to theology for both church and university to which they were both affiliated. Simplifying a bit, Fry's Bart raises questions that more nearly represent the concerns of the insider to the church, and Fry's Schleiermacher raises questions that more nearly represent an insider to the university or secular university. Fry's Bart raises the current concern that Schleiermacher's method of correlation, even when performed in an ad hoc manner, risks losing the integrity, independence, and practical aim of the church's critical self-description, which Fry himself wanted to maintain. Fry Schleiermacher raises the concern that Barth's emphasis on the irreducible specificity of Christian theology risks making Christian-specific language incompatible with other academic discourses. Fry was insistent about this risk. To quote Fry, without the constant continuing practice of correlation, does not Christian theology threaten to turn into an in-group talk of one isolated community among others with no ground rules for mutual discourse among them all? In characteristic fashion, Fry cautioned as well that any theologian interested in a method hospitable the unsubstitutable identity of Jesus Christ, at some point will need to cut their philosophical losses for the sake of, the, of their full-blooded Christian theological interests. But one shouldn't, Fry stress, proceed to that cut too quickly. And Fry wasn't always sure that this point, this latter point, was being heeded clearly enough within some exuberant post-liberal circles. He wanted his students to measure twice before they cut. What I want to suggest is that both the values and risks raised by Fry's Bart and Fry Schleiermacher were very much Fry's own. He wanted to be an insider and an outsider to both the Bardian and the Schleiermacherian legacies. He wanted to maintain that productive tension. We've moved on in how we might frame the debate regarding the place of theology in the university from what Fry faced at Wabash in 1953. We've moved on regarding issues of theological method from what Fry faced at Yale in 1986, and Rachel did a wonderful job 
think expanding that view. But good theological practice, whether then or now, requires the productive tensions discerned through insider-outsider perspectives like Fry's. The health of both church and university, I would suggest, depend upon it. Thank you. Okay, well, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you all for coming. It's especially nice to be up here after uh, those two terrific presentations. Um, I think my own very much resonates with them, as you'll see, although I won't be talking as uh, the last David was uh, in personal terms about Fry. Uh, Fry's academic work was notable for the way it promoted, methodologically at least, an audience of both church and academy for academic theology. Academic theology was to address not just the academy, but a much broader public that included the church, uh, at least if we're frank about it, at least its educated um, membership. Academic theology uh, raised issues of concern for Christians in an intellectually responsible way informed by the best of what university life had to offer. The fact that Fry's work addressed the church was to, great, was to a great extent a function of its subject matter, its material focus, I mean, as we've been hearing over the last couple of days. Fry's work primarily concerned the biblical rendering of the identity of Jesus Christ as an internally generated matter, that is, as a function of the biblical text itself, or in his later work as a function of the church's own Bible-centered ways of understanding who Jesus was and is, how Jesus remains a living presence for Christians in and through their reading of the New Testament. Fry was here resisting trends in modern Christian thought uh, that tried to make sense of the biblical text by substituting an independently specifiable referent or some more general and therefore generally accessible meaning for the quite specific one found within the biblical text itself. For what the text seemed to be saying on its face about the specific person, Jesus Christ. This was all in keeping with the Bardian claim that the Bible was not to be read, like any other book, according to established academic canons for reading either historical texts or texts with a broad human significance. This resistance to academic norms for reading wasn't, was, I think, strongest in Fry's claim that the New Testament conveyed the very reality of Jesus Christ and not just his identity to its Christian readers. The New Testament was not simply like a novel in rendering the identity of a particular person within its covers by way of narrated interactions between character and circumstances, say, but was history-like in making clear that this was a real person coming to its readers in and through the text itself with a living presence. We've been hearing about this over the course of the last few days. For all his resistance to certain academic trends, Fry was obviously no, nevertheless a creature of the uh, academy, given his institutional location. He taught theology not in a church-affiliated seminary or even a university-based uh, divinity school, but in the religious studies department of a major research university. Even as, the, even, as his, even as he resisted some of, his long, of these long-standing academic, academic trends, he was indeed directing his work towards the university. He was addressing the academy in and through the sort of resistance he was offering to it. Fry was well aware of the importance of in, institutional location for theological work especially in posthumously published writings. He correlated trends within the university, uh, especially on the German scene, with trends in the understanding of Jesus as a biblical figure. And those trends were not simply negative for him in their foregrounding of the academy. Worries about certain academic methods weren't 
generalized by him to promote some doctrinaire blanket repudiation. Thus, Fry kept a respectful but wary distance from theologians more prone to outright hostility toward the broader culture typified by elite university life. In this regard, both his private correspondence, I think it's only a private correspondence with Stanley Hauerwas, and uh, his more public engagement with Carl Henry, the evangelical Carl Henry, are important. His treatment of so-called Wittgensteinian fideism in, in posthumously published writings, the Types book, would be another case in point. S significant, too, was his uh, comment to me at some uh, conference or other that the university, to his mind, uh, was all that separated us from barbarism. Uh, and for reasons that David mentioned, he was one to know what barbarism was. Neither a systematically thorough refusal nor blanket acceptance of academic methods was to be recommended. He famously proposed instead a more ad hoc and provisional, uh, for example, apologetics, the specific contours of which were to be, were to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. But this ad hoc approach to every academic discipline didn't mean that each was to be treated in the same way. He clearly spent a lot of time worrying about some academic approaches while cl coming close to endorsing others. Ironically, the importance of the academic disciplines he favored was in the way they helped him provide, the way they helped him uh, to shore up or justify intellectually uh, the church-oriented focus of his work. This use of academic disciplines that highlighted the importance of the particular over the general, the historically specific over the purportedly universal, was an especially clever feature of his work as an academic theologian that set it apart from that at other places, the, at the University of Chicago, for example. It enabled Fry to make sure that church preoccupations weren't diluted or washed out by academic ones, for example, in the way they would be by understanding Christianity as some heightened version of a general human concern. The human concern for, say, basic trust in a loving universe, as you can find it in uh, David Tracy's early work following Schubert Ogden. Instead, academic disciplines pointed to the propriety of looking almost exclusively to Christian sources, such as the Bible, for an understanding of what Christians were concerned about, Jesus, and to specifically Christian norms for interpreting those sources. In his early work, Fry employed the literary theory of new criticism, for example, to help make the point about the self-referential character of meaning and reference in New Testament texts. In his later work, he, along with George Lindbeck, appealed to cultural anthropology in order to stress the self-contained meanings of Christian claims and practices more generally. If Christianity was a cultural linguistic system, one needn't attend to anything beyond a Christian cultural context to understand Christian beliefs and practices. One certainly didn't require purported human universals to make sense of them. This strategy of using academic methods to justify a church-centered analysis isn't just creative, it's uh, very hard to pull off. <laughs> it's tension-filled, to, to use the same language of tension uh, that David just was. Indeed, the shift in the academic approaches that Fry employed uh, came from a growing recognition of the way new, new criticism against Fry's intentions made the Bible simply an instance of a general literary phenomenon. Lots of books have the, fame, the same features that New Criticism calls attention to, using much the same literary mechanisms that New Criticism identifies. While cultural anthropology also suggested Christianity was an instance of the sort of socio-historically specific processes of meaning-making characteristic of human life generally, the meanings made and the cultural processes for generating them within Christianity need not be anything like those found elsewhere. They could remain highly unusual, not materially a simple instance of a more widespread phenomenon. For, in, for instance, 
one way of seeing the world as a hospitable place. I've argued in my book, Theories of Culture, that the account of culture here by Fry and Lindbeck is flawed. Contrary to what they seem to be uh, stressing, Christianity is the sort of culture that essentially depends on others. It takes up the cultural forms of the wider culture, say, and skews them in unpredictable directions to produce a new way of living on its own terms. This idea of Christianity as a parasitic subculture, a culture that makes over another culture, allows for conformity with Fry's Bardian norms of unsu unsubstitutability. Not just Jesus, but Christianity as a whole can remain unsubstitutably, irreplaceably specific while making academic disciplines even more crucial for an academic theology, one that's directed to a church audience. To understand what Christianity is saying, one needs to understand the socio-cultural materials that Christianity is working over in its own terms, using the academic methods that are appropriate to understand the, those materials. Thus, if one wants to understand what Christianity is saying about e economic life, as I'm one of something that I'm interested in, it's not enough to attend simply to Christianity, its beliefs and practices. One also needs to understand the extant economic forms that Christianity is taking up and modifying, what economic life is ordinarily like, and what Christians are doing to it by way of their own distinctive patterns of speech and behavior. The way economic life ordinarily works is to this extent a constitutive feature of Christian meaning making. The latter therefore can't be understood without understanding the former. The placement of theology within a university context becomes all the more important for this reason. The Christian specificity of the theological task in this way feeds moreover a broader university mission. Academic disciplines wouldn't just shore up a church focus, but the church focus would shore up the academic one in turn, at least on a certain understanding of university life. Uh, and there may be some similarities here with what uh, David Ford was saying. The point of doing theology in a university context would become one of entering into, contributing to, a university-wide debate about how life is properly led. Universities in the U.S. have typically had, as part of their educational mission, to prepare intellectually responsible and well-informed citizens to go out into the world uh, and make a difference. Alongside concern for so-called uh, pure, pure research of highly specialized sorts, elite universities retain a social mission of educating good citizens fostering their abilities to address the pressing issues of the day together from a variety of interdisciplinary perspectives. The university becomes one primary site, indeed a kind of ideal microcosm for wide ranging intellectually responsible debate about the character of life together today. What's wrong with it, what's right about it, what needs to be changed about it, and how for what ends. Christian theology has a rightful place in this mix, not primarily on representational grounds, because Christians are a large and influential part of the population at large, or because Christianity has been a major historical force influencing the current scene. Christian theology would have uh, a place at a university-wide debate table, so to speak, to the extent its own propo proposals were novel and compelling, not just as, say, a critical reworking of Christianity for today, but on a host of other grounds as well, informed by the latest university research. Thus, if academic theologians were to argue for some sort of society-wide debt forgiveness on the biblical grounds of Jubilee, what might such a proposal have going for it from the perspective of current social, political, or economic theory? Christian self-understanding might benefit from such interdisciplinary conversation. It might find support or garner salutary criticism, for example. But the university's social mission might be furthered at the same time as well by including Christian perspectives in the mix, again, to the extent that they were novel and interesting and had something 
uh, to contribute. So this proposal of mine, uh, in conclusion, the, this proposal of mine retains the critical edge of Fry's own work regarding the academy. Um, the recommendation of academic theologians might butt up against the conclusions and methods of some economic theories, for example. But this is a theology that, however Christian-specific the sources and norms made use of, cannot do without the input that the academy in its own cannot do without the import, and this is my last sentence, this is great, cannot, this is a sort of theology that for all its Christian specificity can't do without the import of the university in the effort to refashion Christian beliefs and practices for uh, the contemporary day. The end. Thank you so much to all three of you. And I've asked the panelists to actually uh, get the conversation going by uh, posing questions of each other before I open it up. So uh, is there someone you'd like to start? Yeah, David, thank you. So, so, so picking up on uh, uh, the concept uh, that uh, David, you raised at the beginning about healthy pluralism, um, and uh, um, some of the points that uh, uh, Kathy made about the limits, uh, limitations, if you will, of uh, uh, a really combined Fry and Beck uh, cultural linguistic model where, where, the, where the, the text or the community, the linguistic uh, community absorbs the world uh, as opposed to much more dialectical type of process. Uh, it seems that Fry would, uh, would bring, uh, first of all, no super theory, to try to, un oh, to bridge uh, 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 this, this pluralism. Um, uh, would, uh, um, would encourage a journey of particularity so that there actually is a pluralism. Um, and uh, I think would bring a, a healthy skepticism to any kind of uh, in-group talk, as, as I was mentioning. Are there other things that you think, it, uh, first of all, with Fry, but, but also just more generally, uh, that would be uh, imperative for the kind of healthy pluralism that's essential for both the church, uh, and we haven't even talked about the pluralism within the church. Um, and, and also the university. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the, the, the um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's multiple journeys of particularity. You know, I mean, I mean I'm just thinking of a, a faculty where you really are trying to cultivate not only Christian theology and religious studies, you know, studied of, uh, other, but, but, but uh, you know, Islamic theology, you know, uh, Jewish theology and uh, philosophy and so forth, um, and uh, you know, and and what what that it seems to me about and, and you know my ideal for our society I know it's an ideal is of multiple depths that are increasingly in conversation with each other in dialogue with each other of all sorts that that can lead ideally to collaboration and that that collaboration can ideally be embodied in institutions you know that that um and um you know i i, I think that's very much in line with the sort of understanding i have of, of how hans fry operated in this institution and and this is my counter question to those of you who know this institution well out there as well as here um, <laughs> that, that um, you know what sort of a politician was Hans himself in relation to the, 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 the YDS and religious studies here how did he you know he, he always seemed to me to be a, a very dedi very dedicated to the flourishing of the ins both institutions no, and also his college uh, uh, styles and that. And um, you know, what, what, um, wh how, how was he as a politician? And how do you see 
the future. Now, I mean, this is partly about the future of theology. You know, as you look at the future of your own institution here, I'm really interested how YDS and religious studies, you know, how are you conceiving a future and how would Hans Fry's legacy help to shape that, 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 that future as you understand it, Cathy? Uh, well, um, is this, yep. Uh, I mean, my sense of uh, Hans was that he was an extremely... Maybe a little closer. He was an extremely good politician. Yes. Uh, very... <laughs> um, he was often in leadership roles, you know, as the head of college, but also as a chair of religious studies and made a... Uh, you know, he seemed to be able to get things done. I don't know exactly how they were gotten done, but... Um, but, yeah, but that, that's just the... That doesn't speak to the wider question. Uh, I think the question that you're raising, and I'm also raising, and I think David as an administrator is raising, is what, what's the university for? And, on, and how does it go about uh, furthering whatever mission it has? I mean, it's, it's a genuinely pluralistic situation where there isn't uh, disciplinary, <coughs> disciplinary uniformity or uh, a lot of substantive uniform, uh, agreement of, on much, but it, but it seems to me that you could still have um, university missions that are uh, that bring people together, uh, you know, to discuss issues that have a real uh, importance for the contemporary world, uh, and that that can be done cooperatively without the kind of overarching, um, uh, you know, shared uh, disciplinary frameworks. Uh, Etc. that used to be the case, or supposedly were the case. I don't know if you're an administrator. How's, how's the sound, everybody? Can you hear? <laughs> but can I just yep. say one more thing? Yeah, I mean, sure. one, one of the issues has to do with, again, you, you brought it up, um, whether the university is a place where people are really concerned to make judgments about what's right and good and true. And, um, you know, it still seems to me that there's a um, not very well thought through um, disjunction be between descriptive and normative work uh, that uh, is not very helpful for university life. Um. So, so uh, unfortunately, from a, from an academician's perspective. Uh, the challenges in the world don't line up neatly with disciplines and fields. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, the th one of the things I think that uh, um, within the university or college setting is really trying to create those, those opportunities, those frameworks for, for addressing uh, as a community challenges from a multidisciplinary perspective. I think that's what Kathy was talking about, but by talking about the uh, talking about both jubilee and uh, economic theory at the same time, um, and uh, uh, in those kind of uh, broader challenges that we're facing, of course, uh, uh, religion plays an enormously important role, and uh, so so I think if we if we start with the with the ends, namely trying to address challenges in the um, that uh, we can find ways actually for for institutions to to um, break down their silos. Um, of course, there's a lot of other issues involved just in terms of how the politics of a university works. Uh, si silos are there because they concentrate power. And we need to interrogate how that power is constructed and how it perpetuates itself uh, if we're really going to address some of these Other questions for each other? Yeah, just, just a thought that, that um, <clears throat> you know, the, it's the descriptive and the normative thing that you, you know, which is so complex, isn't it, in, in all the disciplines. And, um, you know, I, I think my goal would be that the university can cultivate both intelligent and wise faith, you know, in other words, that you can do constructive theology 
in, in, in a university. <laughs> um, and that you can have intelligent and wise understanding of faith, so to speak. That's the more descriptive side. You know, because if we have to have a, a pluralist society, you know, the, the sheer ignorance about relig religion and the prejudice and so forth, you know, it is just absolutely massive within the religions as well as between them, as well as in the secular side of things. And, and therefore, you know, if universities can't cultivate both of those, you know, intelligent and wise faith and intelligent and wise understanding of faith, and bring them into dialogue with each other, uh, you know, really we've, we failed, you know, and, and we won't have a healthily plural society. But could I ask another big question? Just, just toss in. I mean, it's, it's you again, I'm afraid. But also, I mean, I'm sure you as an administrator, what about money? Uh, you know, that, that w w one of the, the massive game changers I found in, in, in different settings is, you know, is money. Who, who, who funds what? And where does the money come from? What, 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 how do tails wag dogs and so, and, and so forth? And um, I, I'm just really interested, you know, Kant must have had to deal with that, uh, you know, in, in his institutional side. I don't know how he did. I never talked to him about that particular thing. But, um, you know, what, 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 what is the, the theology of, you know, you, you having done a lot of, econ you know, what's the theology of money in relation to YDS at the moment? Use, use your mic. Yeah. 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 Money is extremely important. It depends on what you do with it. Yeah. And, and you know, well, we've got a, our dean right here who can speak to uh, fundraising efforts, but uh, that's a lot of the question. I mean, what are you, what are you re raising the money for? I mean, what, 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 what's important about it and what, uh, what's the con contribution that's being made by it? I mean, if you're funding, you know, full scholarships for students, uh, that's... You know, or a living village. Those are, those are, you know, one can think about um, the value um, of 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 what what might come of it. But um, I don't know. What do you have in mind? Yeah. Well, well, the UK well, is well, a different situation. Yes, I mean the UK is so different in relation to this. We're much more dependent on the government. But what we're doing is we're moving more towards the American model. You know, where where you basically. You know, in Cambridge, it's one of the few places, I suppose, in the UK where you can actually raise endowment. You know, and 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 you know, I, I felt that the sort of endowments that the the Faculty of Divinity got over, you know, in in, in recent decades ha has been absolutely crucial in enabling the flourishing of the of the field. You know that, and and also, of course, what it does is it increases respect in the institution, which really does respect money. You know, you know that it's all right having intellectual arguments, you know, with the with the uh, in the university, but if you actually bring in an endowments, especially, you know, and uh, but but all sorts of other uh, f funding things, that 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 makes an enormous difference, and of course that plays into the whole sort of society we have in terms of where money, you know, who makes money, who has money, who who gives it, and so forth, who's in a position to, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm just intrigued how, how, you know, how the future of, uh, maybe the dean should speak to it, you know, the, the, you know, how, how, how does the, the um, uh, you know, this figure in the, the vision of the, the future of YDS? I mean, I get, you know, invitations to contribute here almost every second week. Uh, you know. <laughs> Shall we open it up on that note? Are we ready? Or did, did, did you want to say something, Catherine? No? Okay, David? Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's please, yeah. Questions and responses. Thank you. Uh, my name is Randy Ross. I graduated from here in 1972. I tell people I turn up every 50 years. I, I had a one-on-one -on -one reading course with Hans Frey. I cannot remember how I managed to arrange that, but he was in, at Penn one summer, and I was home in Delaware. And once a week, I rode the train up to Philadelphia 
and took in my, uh, carried in my reading assignment and made a report to him and we had a discussion and went back home with the next week's reading assignment. After several weeks of this, uh, I don't know if he thought he'd figured me out or he was a little frustrated, but he said, quoting someone else, but he said to me, you know, you believe too little to believe as much as you do, but you believe too much not to believe more than you do. I remember those words distinctly. And having been summed up like that, I want to switch over to the title of this uh, conference, which is one of the reasons I came, called Generous Orthodoxy, which I would like to hear someone address, either from today's panel or yesterday, since I didn't ask this yesterday. What is generous about orthodoxy, or Hans Frey's orthodoxy, or your orthodoxy? How does this evidence itself and 50 years later, would it say something to me other than you believe too little? Thank you. Anyone on the panel want to take that? Come on, be generous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start the conversation off on this. Um, so, so uh, the way in which I understand that uh, in Fry, um, uh, the the too little he he was very uh, oriented toward how ideas shape people and communities, and what would be too little would be that which is unable to shape persons and communities. But they also shouldn't be rigid. And um, for, uh, for reasons within a tradition and also engaging um, other perspectives, other the host culture, other disciplines, whatever, these are all about uh, a conversation in order to shape communities and, and individuals. So my guess is, uh, I, I think he was probably saying something like, uh, you know, you have, you, you, you need to, you need to bring a point of view, but a point of view that's actually holistic, bodied, rich. I asked Hans, just after he'd given, you know, as he was giving his Cadbury lectures in 1987 in Birmingham. Um, I asked him on one of our wonderful walks um, what his own position was in the, in the types. And um, as you can imagine, it wasn't a straightforward one that he, he just said simply, I'm type this or type that. <laughs> but, but, but <laughs> after meandering around various things, you know, you know my, my sense was that uh, he was a dialectic between three and four at center, but he also said the book he'd bring to a desert island would be Kant's religion within the bounds of reason alone. You know, that in other words, and, and I remember the book he picked up out of my library was uh, Fergus Kerr's one on Wittgenstein uh, and theology. Uh, and that was the book he read during the, during the time he was, you know, he, he was writing the lectures as well as reading. And I, I think this says something about the, a generous orthodoxy, you know, that it's, it's not that you, you have one, you plonk one, 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 one rigid type or something, you know, but that you, you have a sort of perichoresis between between all the types, but you also know where your where your heart is, where your where where, where your centre is, and and it seemed to me that on some issues, uh, I mean, this is me. I, I'm interested in what other people think. So many of you would have thought a lot about this, uh, but on some issues, the the uh, Hans would be very much the type three, and uh, you know others he'd be you know bringing in things for from from all the other ways, but but that. 
at heart, probably, you know, it was type four. I'm looking at George in particular here, just to ask George, what would your think, thought about, uh, uh, on, you know, on Hans, Hans's generous orthodoxy in terms, in terms of the five types? You know, I mean, it seems to me that he, he, he'd want all of them to be kept in play, uh, you know, and to, to have them within your horizon, but that centrally it is, it is type four with a, with a lot of type three. I mean, the, the originality of the types is, isn't it, bringing Schleiermacher and Bart so close together? Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> 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 this question came up at lunch, too, so anybody who was, yeah, at lunch who wants to weigh in. I, some of you who were here in, uh, at Yale when I was may remember this conversation as well. He told some of us at one point that, yes, of course I'm four with a bit of three, but don't forget about five. I mean, and there's that uh, theology after Wittgenstein thing. I think he had some sympathy. He didn't want to put all his eggs in that basket, but he had some inclinations. Okay, other questions? Oh, yeah, please. Um, there were a number of things that you said that I thought were fascinating that could be unpacked more, but the, uh, I wondered if you could say a little bit more about what you meant by insider-outsider. I mean, one way of understanding what you're saying about Fry is that he was an insider. He was just uncomfortable uh, inside. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that he was outside and sometimes inside, but you know, he, was, he was just an insider, but with a wariness or suspicion about... I don't know, the people around him. Uh, can you say a little bit more about what you meant by inside, uh, inside, outside, kind of what that meant? Sure, that, I mean, I, uh, I was just playing with, it, with something that would be uh, easy code, um, and we'd have to really unpack that in all sorts of different kinds of ways. Um, you know, I think he, uh, I, you know, I, 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 you made the observation that uh, um, his uh, his identification with the university, when when uh, when uh, uh, rightly functioning, uh, is a resistance to barbarism, and uh, there w and I think what he associated with that, it, and I get this actually in his uh, fascination with uh, Gotthold Lessing. There's this kind of restlessness. Um, um, to to um, a, a suspicion of one's own concepts, uh, one's own binaries. That's why I think he was so fascinated by religion within the limits of reason alone. Kant's re religion within the limits of reason alone, because written at the end of his career, right? Kant's at the end of his career, uh, he his discussion of grace there, which would undermine the, the whole the whole ethical system, Kantian ethical system, he really admired that, that uh, perspective. And so that was on intellectual side. I also, though, think that very much as, as a human being, um, he had experienced all sorts of, uh, of uh, uh, good intentions when becoming too myopic, being destru destructive. Um, it, he, that was in, in uh, his discussion, uh, his response at the Moltmann conference uh, back in the 70s, I think was really a response to, uh, I think his word was there was a kind of joyousness, um, uh, com confidence uh, that, that uh, he, uh, here he drew on H, uh, Reinhold Nietzsche. Um, and and uh, the kind of realism there, um, but I but I think he, I think just exist I just think as a person he never felt uh, uh, like he identified fully in any one place. And after a time, he actually thought of that as a very productive thing for himself. But you 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 probably have some ideas about this too. No, that was a genuine question. Okay. <laughs> I wonder, could I ask both of you a question, if that's all right? The, 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 um, 
the, the, uh, uh, about, about Fry and Lindbeck. Uh, you know, Cathy, you did bring them very much together in your, you know, very brief statement about how you differ from them on the cultural issue, you know, and, and you, you brought them together on that. And yet there's quite profound differences between Lindbeck and Fry, aren't there? Not least on the way in which they relate to culture and, and so forth. You know, you know that, that they don't, you know, Fry, Fry didn't go along with all that George was saying. I mean, would you like to just nuance that and talk a bit about how they differ as well as how, how, how they were similar? Because it was quite important for, you know, a lot, a lot of people how to relate to each of them. Yeah, no, there are clearly yeah, some significant differences uh, between them, and like Paul DeHart and his book has laid some of those oh, out. Yeah. Yep, yep. Don't talk well, to me. Yes, yeah, I, I was trying to do both, but um, yeah, significant differences. Uh, there are um, a number of uh, treatments of their differences uh, in, in book length, uh, form. So, yeah, it's possible that I'm, uh, yeah, in a, in a presentation like this, assimilating Fry's position on culture too much to Lindbeck's, which was more bounded and uh, had different uh, consequences in terms of uh, how Christians should relate to the wider culture. I don't think Fry was uh, as concerned as Lindbeck was uh, for the, the church to uh, work as the kind of um, uh, critical public force that uh, Lindbeck seemed to be proposing comparable to what was going on um, in the early church, say. But, uh, but uh, the import of what you're saying is that uh, that would seem to be unfair to Fry, that there was more nuance and uh, complexity and depth uh, about the understanding of culture in the same way that the, the, four, the five types were um, remained in play, and, and he wasn't simply proposing one over the other, uh, the others. Yep, that's helpful. Thanks. So it, we have time for one more question, if the answer is brief. <laughs> and if the question it's a, is it's brief. A, it's a fairly simple, practical question, but um, I entered here um, out one year after um, graduating from small liberal arts college. It was almost an extension of collegiate life for me. Uh, living on the quad and so forth. Um, and um, I, um, I was moved by the story yesterday of, of um, uh, Mr. Fry um, teaching an undergraduate course at Yale College. I imagine that was not unique. Uh, he was legendary as a head of college at, at Ezra Stiles. In fact, I know two different couples for whom he officiated their marriages, and I'm sure there are many, many others who could talk about the warmth. Uh, and it seems that that has been uh, echoed in so many different ways, very analytically, very imaginatively, uh, provocatively over these last uh, several hours, yesterday and today. But what about Hans Frey, pastor? He was a priest of the Episcopal Church. He was a... Uh, faculty member at Seminary of the Southwest briefly, I believe, before he came to Yale, and he was a small college religion professor, which has a pastoral aspect as well. Um, I'm biased. I didn't go to Wabash, but um, I went to a co-ed college like Wabash. I, you know, I, I think that's uh, a question specifically about uh, ecclesial communities. Um, I, I, I wouldn't answer that just because I don't think I'm in a good enough pl position to be able to answer that. But I do think he thought of, uh, of uh, his community of students everywhere as, as being a a holistic educational role, and that, that includes these pastoral components to it, no doubt about it. I think 
there's a, there are generations of Fry students, whether at the Divinity School or at the Graduate School, for whom he was profoundly uh, shaping in that way. Yeah, I don't have any uh, personal experience of his uh, leadership within a church community as a pastor or priest or whatever. But there was a pastoral dimension, although that, that story does not sound so pastoral, but uh, a pastoral dimension of his, uh, to his mentoring. Uh, that, that's in, in great part what's represented by people who've come to this conferences and to, to others. I mean, they had a very close personal connection to him. And how exactly he managed to generate that, I was never, I was never quite clear. I mean, I saw it on lots of, in lots of cases. but. Uh, in my own experience, if I were to generalize from it, I mean, he, he uh, gave you the sense that, yeah, in a very holistic way, he was concerned about you as a person, and that uh, when, when he was one-on-one -on -one with you, he was just one-on-one -on -one with you, and it was a very intense kind of focus. Um, uh, I'd say the other thing, uh, the humility aspect of him personally, uh, he elicited your own uh, compassion for him. You know, how can I, how can I help poor Fry figure out, you know, the terms to use to make sense of this? Um, yeah, so it was extremely disarming in, in that way. Well, I think on that note, David Ford, David Kamitska, and Catherine Tanner, thank, thank you, you very, so very much. much.